out a lot of things for you guys to participate in and to be knowledgeable on that we really want you all to know about. So make sure that you're really excited and participating and happy homecoming to everybody who's here also. Woo! Woo! homecoming, you We are so excited that you're here and I hope you have a wonderful time watching. Thank you so much. We, it is also my pleasure to invite comments from our current UNT Men's Speech President, Ms. Avery Davis. Hello and welcome to everyone who is here today. today. I apologize. Today's event. Um, this is our very first public debate of the year, which is a very exciting thing that we provide for the campus, where we host debates between our debate members and other people like our British team here that we are hosting. Last year we had some representatives debating. It was a really great time. So with no further ado, I'd like to give this to Dr. Brian Lane and let's get this thing going. Woo! Thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, we're very, very excited. Uh, UNT Debate is pleased to host another international debate. You know, UNT Debate has uh, been there always for UNT. In fact, we've been raising the level of discussion on important issues from a very, very long time. It's Homecoming Week, and part of Homecoming Week is recognizing the incredible history of UNT Debate. And UNT Debate dates back quite a ways through UNT's history. Back to 1901, our debate team has been a constant force for civil discussion on campus through international debates and other competitions. So we're very, very happy to do it. Our topic today has to do with open borders. A very timely topic, um, one that is really being discussed quite a bit in our current uh, senatorial election. Luckily, we have some experts on borders here with us to perform tonight's debate. I'd like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about each one of them. Let me start by introducing the colonizers, I mean the British. <laughs> I'm Let's Irish. Start with, uh, <laughs> let me start with the British team. Um, Owen McMahon is uh, our, Owen Mooney, sorry, he's up here first. Owen's a recent graduate in economics from the University of Glasgow. And uh, speaking from the Glasgow University he Union, he's won, get this, the Scottish, the British, and European Universities Debating Championship, as well as 15 other competitions across Europe. So he's crossed many borders in his debate experience. He's also served as the chief adjudicator of competitions in the UK, in Ireland, in the UAE, and even in Pakistan. All right. He's an experienced debater and a public speaker. He's worked in a variety of uh, political backgrounds. Uh, he's even worked on the 2014 Scottish Independence Referendum. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? He's done an incredible, incredible job. <laughs> And uh, we had the pleasure of spending some time with Owen recently and found out that he is also an incredible fan of fried food. <laughs> yes, he's loving the fried food that we have been able to provide for him. He is joined by his colleague, Maeve McMahon Flanagan from St. Andrews, where she, is, uh, she earned a master's in international studies during that time. Maeve is an oracy coach for the uh, ESU, the English Speaking Union. And in 2016, she was the winner and, I believe, the top speaker of the Queen's University Belfast Tournament in there. She's also, a, 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 she's also worked as the ESU's Oracy Coach in the Debate Academy in 2018. And she's worked for the Secondary School's Discover Your Voice program. And I'm very, very happy to announce that Maeve is also a qualified conflict mediator. So if we get into com conflict here, we're going to look to Maeve to solve this and try and push us forward on things uh, to move our, our, our debate along for, for items. Um, we've had an opportunity to spend some time with Maeve, and she's managed to do really, really well on the tour despite being Irish. So it's gone really, really nicely so far. Really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce you to our uh, UNT uh, opponent, our UNT team. Uh, first, we're going to start with Alex Dixon from UNT Debate. Alex has been doing debate at the college level for three years. She's both a National Parliamentary Debate Association Champion and an International Public Debate Association Champion at the FIRO Phi level. She's continuing her work at UNT and plans to pursue a Master's Degree in Communication Studies with a focus on organizational and interpersonal communication. So give it up for Alex. She is joined on the UNT side by Brendan Deming. He's currently a Graduate Assistant Coach and he is the policy debate consultant currently from Melissa High School, himself a runner-up for policy debate in the UIL State Tournament and 
coach of the 2015 state runner-up for the policy debate tournament in 4A. Brendan hopes to become a high school debate coach after graduating. He's currently completing his master's degree in communication studies. Let's give it up for Brendan. the actual debate itself. So we are going to use a format that is common to our British compatriots and parliamentary style, in which the debaters will each deliver a seven-minute constructive speech. Now I will tell you during these, uh, during these speeches, it's completely acceptable for you to participate in these. If you hear a good point, you might want to pay attention to that, although maybe there's a question. Please softly, please softly. Okay. And if you uh, hear a point that you don't disagree with, you can hear it. You know, say whatever you would like to say to voice your opposition. Or While you're listening to the debate and hearing all of our speakers, please follow along with us on Twitter under the hashtag UNTBritDebate because after we have had four speecher, speakers, we'll then open it up to audience questions. And we'll have an opportunity to hear from questions in the audience here as well. We can take some tweeted questions as we're following live on Facebook. Wait, what do you even call that? Live? Facebook? Yeah. Live? Facebook Live. <laughs> I do the technologies. I do the technologies. Let's keep this going. Now, one thing I must say, please keep in mind that uh, the arguments presented tonight may or may not represent the individual views of the speakers. In fact, in order to have a civil discussion, you may hear persons defending arguments that they do not necessarily believe in from time to time. That is to say, in the name of argument, all debaters at times play the part of, of devil's advocate. So keep that in mind tonight when we hear our different speakers as they are talking. With all that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Tonight, UNT will be affirming the topic, this house prefers open borders. Please welcome the Prime Minister for this debate, Mr. Brendan Deming. <laughs> Hey, hi, hola! I'm Brendan. Now let's now get affirmed today's topic. This house prefers a world with open borders. Now, let's clarify for a second. What is open borders? Open borders are not this utopian and fantasy-esque land in which Donald Trump with his tittle, tiny little orange hands raised on all the borders. Right, that is not our position, that is not our argument. Rather, let's define what open borders are. Alex and I argue that this is rather a huge misnomer that the British will probably be arguing in this particular debate. Instead, our argument is that the uh, open borders are ones in which a free flow of migration devoid or lacking of internal border regulations occurred, i.e., in other words, a border lacking of things like border patrol and ICE. So we would affirm, we want you to affirm our position. Uh, for instance, Spain and Portugal is a pretty good example, right? Our argument is that Spain and Portugal has a porous border in which uh, free flow of migrants can come across the border. There's never been a holistic or large instance in which terrorism, crime or something problematic has occurred in that. And we would say that this would be reciprocal insofar as an American border is concerned. And as my uh, boy 2 Change says, it'll be a vibe. So uh, you should prefer a world with open borders. Yes. Do you also envisage these borders being open to the free movement of goods, services, and capital, or will it just be people? Sure. Two, two responses. First, we'll subsume this argument and answer this within the speech itself. Second, uh, we would probably say that this is a result of migrants coming over into the United States, right? So, we would say, as uh, my boy Owen says, these things occur for the following two reasons. First is the dope economy, right? And second is refugees, that these are reasons why we should affirm open borders. Our first argument is that this would benefit the economy. First, restrictions on legal immigration are pushing the best and the brightest outside of our country. STEM workers, nurses, uh, intelligence individuals uh, are not, or rather, barred from coming into the United States because of people like Trump. We would say that in a world with open borders, this would send a signal to allow for these individuals to come into the United States. We would say to these individuals, hashtag, you're pretty dope. Come on over. 
Second, we would say that another crisis or correction is on the horizon. Our argument is that within the status quo, a economic correction or recession is inevitable. It is only time, and rather our argument is one of which is able to fix this. We would say that a free flow of migrants coming into the country would be able to solve these issues, right? Our argument is that open borders would send a signal for these immigrants to come on over to the United States. Those slots that we're currently having a rough time filling. I mean, Trump recently said himself, quote, we should have a uh, policy which is beautiful, humane, and strong. And I cannot agree more. I say that this is a beautiful policy which is pretty humane and pretty strong for migrants coming over to the United States. Additionally, the current system is sending a signal that is absolutely reprehensible. Whenever immigrants do try and come over to the United States, they are locked in cages and precluded from coming over. To quote my favorite book and the big man himself, Dr. Seuss in Green Eggs and Ham, we must keep children in a box and we must keep them with a fox. Well, I would say that the fox is probably Donald Trump and the current policies. We say that we would prevent these policies from uh, further marginalizing and dehumanizing immigrants from coming into the United States. But, to quote my boy 21 Savage, we can add five, six, seven, or even eight ends to the bank account of the United States. If we do open borders, right? Trade and manufacture would also go up. All oh, right, all right, all right, as Matthew McConaughey says. There's currently a manufacturing crisis in the status quo so far as industries being unable to fill these jobs. Our argument is that we cannot fill these jobs and that these jobs are unable to be filled because of ourselves, not because of a migrant brown body population. That is a racist and rather uh, uh, obfuscated way to talk about the status quo. That is a deflection technique. Saying immigrants take our jobs is just a deflection away from why these jobs are not being filled in the first place. We blame the most or vulnerable population instead of ourselves. One example of uh, another example or reason why we should affirm open borders is the refugees. Uh, one example is the Syrian crisis. Syrians are being massively slaughtered in the status quo, and societies like the United States are uh, more willing to do nothing for these individuals and allow them to uh, propagate or be having violence propagated upon their bodies. We say that history proves Germany, when we did nothing for the immigrants to come into the United States, but now we have a time, and the Syrian refugee crisis is probably a good example of us being able to do something to provide them a safe haven to be not gassed and to be not militarized insofar as their bodies are concerned. We would say that we are witnessing a massive shift in humanity that we have never seen before. Today, more than 68 million individuals are displaced from their homes, and we have a moral obligation. I would say this too. If it was you in their place, you wouldn't want to be gassed. If it was you in their place, you wouldn't want to be marginalized in any capacity. Second example is the Honduran crisis. As of today, thousands of refugees are currently marching. Yeah, Owen. Um, approximately how many people do you envisage would move to the developed world under this policy? Oh, good question, my boy. Uh, two responses. <laughs> First, our argument is one of a spillover argument. Our argument is that other countries would model us, and this would uh, then allow for other countries such as Canada to then model the United States policy as a result. And plus, our argument is that, yeah, it's pretty dope to let immigrants over. Like, it's pretty simple, right? Uh, the second way is the Honduras crisis. Thousands of refugees are currently marching here to the United States as we speak. We need to rec recognize that these people need help, and history proves every time Every time that there's been a group marginalized in some type of capacity, we've done nothing. We should learn from our example and our mistakes and do something, i.e. doing open borders. See World War II and how Congress said, and I quote, let's not do a damn thing about it. I disagree with that temporal Congress and we should do something about that today. Over 5,000 individuals are coming over to the United States from Honduras currently. We should utilize open borders as a means to allow for these individuals to come in. The third example is the Afghanistan crisis. As a result of 2003 the Afghanistan crisis, multiple individuals have fled from terrorism and have fled from crime. They will probably come up here and make the argument that uh, people from other countries are going to be terrorists. The brown body is a terrorist. We would say that actually the argument operates in the reverse. They're not trying to become terrorists because they are refugees. They're trying to flee from refugee-based crises. They have the argument backwards, right? The fourth example is climate refugees. And the status quo, climate change is on a significant height. And this is currently making it to where refugees are uh, dis being displaced. We would say that open borders is a pretty dope ass policy. I for it.
seven minutes, and I don't think I've heard an argument to do the policy, because what Brendan's done is stand up here and say, here are a whole load of situations in which immigration is good. We agree. We like immigration. There are currently about a million or so immigrants who come to the US every year, about half of the EU. We'd like to stay great level. We would like to keep it at this level. We might even need to want to see us take more refugees and asylum seekers. What he hasn't done, and what the prop's burden is to do, is to explain why abolishing border checks in their entirety and opening all the borders is a good policy. We can get literally all of his benefits on our side of the house. Most of them are just describing why he likes immigration. I'm going to make an extremely controversial claim here. Most people are good people. Some people are not. We would quite like to have a border so we can check and keep out the few people who are bad and let in the large numbers of people who are good, rather than entirely abolishing security and border checks and all the rest of it. We're going to talk about three groups here. One, I'm going to talk about the migrants themselves and why their life gets worse. Secondly, I'm going to talk about why this, this policy is disastrous for the countries that they come from. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about why it's bad for the countries they go to. We'll win this on the entire world. Why not? Okay, first of all, how is it this migrants' lives will get worse as a result of the policy of open border? Um, a couple of simple premises to this. Number one, lots of people don't like migrants. Currently, this is the majority of the electorate in the United States and in fact across the developed world. Secondly, most of these people want to maintain their culture or feel their culture, identity, or economy are threatened by immigrants coming in from abroad. The question is not necessarily that they are right. The question is just as long as that they feel so. They will want to, and there will be a need and political capital for them to, for them to want to stop immigration. I'll take you later on. Um, so what is it that these people are likely to do? What is it that the Donald Trumps of the world do, given they don't just magically disappear on their side of the house? They try to make migrants' lives miserable as a means to stop them from coming. The reason the United States is currently snatching children away from their parents and locking them in cages isn't because they think these children are a security threat. It's to disincentivize other migrants from coming. It's to scare them, to say, this is what will happen to you if you cross our borders. Policies like these are more likely under their side of the house and crucially apply to all immigrants, including the vast numbers who are currently in the West. Now, what do these policies look like? First of all, it just looks like, an, like a mat, like these, and these could all be grouped under the heading of hostile environment, which is the name given to these types of policies in the US, in Britain, in Australia. First of all, it often just looks like overt racism, like targeting Mexicans, like targeting Muslims on the street, and an incentive to make their lives worse and try and drive them out. Second, it looks like introducing policies to make new migrants afraid of coming. It, it, it's things like taking their children away from them and because you brand them a security threat. It's things like refusing to give them, like refusing to pay them proper wages. Um, thirdly, it can look like things like imposing economic hardship. So very often this is what's done with refugees and asylum seekers. Who, we all have a legal ob obligation to accept asylum seekers. But what these governments do, what the governments of the far right do, is instead pass laws saying that they can't work, is deny them benefits, is make it so it's impossible for them to survive economically in the world. Fourthly, they hurt them through internal controls. Australia is actually a really great example of where this is done, whereby all asylum seekers and refugees to Australia are passed through Nauru, which is an island which the United States, which the United Nations recently led into a concentration camp. They let them in, their borders are open for them to come in, but when they're in, they control them and hurt them in other ways. These policies are more likely under the prop. I mean, you might think all this is a little bit extreme, and it certainly sounds extreme, but just think about the degree of threat that is felt or imagined by older people, by white nationalists, by the right wing, by right -wing voters across all of the countries. Like, Donald Trump was literally elected on a platform because people were afraid that immigrants were destroying their culture and taking over their lives. I think these types of policies I'm describing aren't an exaggeration. I think they're an extremely likely consequence of this fear. Like, we're literally seeing these policies happen now, and they're more likely to happen if you open all borders and remove all checks. Even in the best case for them, most migrants face extreme hostility. Like, their lives don't get better economically, because very often they all have similar skill sets. So you're all trying to move into, their, into similar industries, so you drive down, which has the effect of driving down wages for them. I don't think migrants' lives are improved in quality, uh, are improved in quality by this. I think this makes their lives worse off. Secondly, why is, this, why is this worse for the countries that they come from? Again, immigration has been phenomenal for the United States. It's been excellent for like the EU, where we totally abolished all internal border checks. 
has been excellent for Britain, France, and Germany, but it's been catastrophic for the nations of Eastern Europe and the poorer countries on the periphery. Because look, here's what happens. It's the concept of brain drain. They say the problem with borders is we suck in all the best, and, uh, is we keep out the best and brightest. But the converse is also true. If you suck in all the best and brightest, then you deny vital skills to other countries in the world. Like Britain's imposed, imposed thousands and thousands of doctors from India and from East Africa and former colonies. But that's terrible for these countries because now all of their trained doctors leave to go to the West where wages are higher. This is even worse when, when they say we're not talking about labor, we're not talking about capital or wages or whatever, we're just talking about people. Because it prevents these people from sending money back home when needed if you still maintain checks for that. So this is crippling for the countries that they're coming from. Secondly, there often is just labor shortages. Because, like, look, just because borders are open, that doesn't mean travel is free. It's often difficult, dangerous, and expensive to come from Afghanistan to Europe or the United States. So who comes? Who comes are young, fit people, are young, fit young men and women. They leave behind the old, the sick, and the vulnerable. And this often creates massive shortages, especially if we're talking about agrarian economies. This literally might mean you can't take in the harvest because all of your workers have left to go abroad to the United States. That's terrible for the people who are left behind, who are some of the most vulnerable and the most important people who you should care most about in this debate. Thirdly, why is this harmful for the countries that they go to? And I'll take a question on this if you've got any. Yeah, you're from Ireland. Doesn't Ireland have open borders? I'm from Scotland! <laughs> but this is the example I'm giving. The EU has open borders, and it's great for the rich and well-off countries within that who are already fine. It is bad for the poorer countries in the EU. You should care more about poorer people than you should about people in countries who are already badly off. Thirdly, why is it bad for the countries they go to? So this is a really interesting one. Because, like, look, obviously it is true. Uh, like, it's just trivially true that the vast majority of migrants are good people, great people who are, who, are, who are good for the countries they come to. And only a very small minority are criminals or dangerous or whatever. But the point is, we would like to keep out that small minority, and borders might be a useful way of us doing so. Like, like it, it, it genuinely is laughable. Like, he's literally just Googled Portugal, Spain, picked two countries in the EU who are next to each other, and asserted there's never been any problem with traffic crossing their border. All of the cocaine in Europe arrives by arriving in Portugal and then being shipped through the EU, where because we don't have border controls, we can't check or monitor this effectively to any, de effectively to any degree. Like, uh, effectively to any degree. I'd also like to point out, like, most cartels, criminal organizations, terrorist groups, don't try and send people across borders, because they know we have border controls and we will block them and keep them out. But if you abolish all borders, there's literally no disincentive for ISIS to say, fuck it, I'll send a few thousand fighters over to Turkey. Why not? We can do some better terrorism that way. This policy is going to be terrible for the immigrants themselves, it's bad for the countries they come from, it's bad for the countries they go to, you should have paused. Woo!
Trump has created these scare tactics, and that's why people like won't come over. Because the immigration itself isn't the problem. It's that Trump is saying, no, we don't want any more of you, so we're going to separate the children. Incorrect. This separation of children has been going on for centuries. Also, the point of the separation started whenever borders started. Even back when the UK had a border, they also separated families, not as a scare tactic, not as a deterrence, but simply because it was a border. We can fix that, and Brenda does an amazing job of explaining it. Additionally, whenever they're talking about how, like, our system currently, or even any system with a porous border, doesn't allow for people to work once they get here. That's because of the visa systems. Things like the HB1 visa, or the H4 visa, or all of the other H visas literally talk about stopping people from working or giving them permission to work. Any country has those visas, that is the problem. But the affirmative is actually the way to stop it. It is the key, the golden key, if you will, to getting rid of this border and eradicating that discrimination. But the only way to make change is voting affirmative in today's debate round. The second argument that they make is that it's bad for the countries that they come from. Let's highlight that the reason that refugees go from country to country isn't because they just want to and it's a sheer vacation. It's because places like Myanmar are persecuting Rohingya Muslims and pushing them out of their country because of religious views. Or let's look to somebody like, or some country like Venezuela, where their inflation rate is literally over a million in inflation. That's something that you can't even fathom. To put it in perspective, eggs cost what? three dollars here, eggs there cost to the equivalent of 150 U.S. dollars, or 1,500 bolivar. Question. Yeah. Um, every single country in the world, except North Korea, has signed the Geneva Convention on the Rights of Refugees, so are legally obliged to take refugees. So what does this policy do exactly that changes the status of refugees? It's a total red herring. Uh, actually, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Specifically, we get onto this further in my second argument, where it talks specifically about how, like, the economy allows them to establish positions in which that they can create jobs. So they're not refugees, refugees being they run from country to country, but rather refugees within themselves that are now part of the citizen body. We have to keep in mind that we're all humans. Not, we are Americans, they are Mexican, and we don't like them. That ideology is what's problematic, and it all started from the border. I challenge all of you that even if you have those types of ideologies, that you think about where they came from. It was from generational past. Specifically, let's highlight that their third argument where it's talking about it's bad for countries that they go to. This is actually not correct. It's created a cultural uh, immersion in which the cultures of these refugees or immigrants are allowed to be seen and showed. Even at that level, yeah, there's some discrimination. I'm not gonna argue that that's not bad. I argue that the affirmative is the only way to potentially solve it. But two, I also say that the cultural immersion that does happen is good for the future. Because if we allow people to see that there is a type of culture that is not our own, and we try to listen to other people's perspectives, which I can't force you to do that, but if we allow it to happen, I'll get you at the bottom of this. If we allow it to happen, then we're able to see what other people look at, different perspectives, which allow our policy making to change. Additionally, I don't know where they get this argument that it's bad for the countries themselves about their economy. That's actually empirically false. Specifically, entrepreneurship and the movement of money. The stimulation and circulation of money and goods is what creates an economy that booms. Every article that we, both Brendan and I, read in preparation for this round say that it boosts the economy because immigrants are over 38% attributed to our economic wealth. Yeah. Okay, so should Native Americans be allowed to keep white people off their reserves, or is that a border? Um, so, I think that that's a different debate than this one, specifically because, like, the colonialists of America decided that they were going to squash what was the land, but also I would argue that a lot of people on reserves, specifically Native Americans, or rather indigenous people, would allow people to have open trade. It's a matter of fearful things that have happened because of the colonialist ideologies that created the borders in the first place. Keep in mind, we created those borders when we put them there. Specifically onto the affirmative. <coughs> Owen doesn't touch our arguments whenever we're talking about the brain drain. He just says this is actually bad. No, we argue specifically that what this does is it allows for these people to not only feel safe, but economically viable. Opening the border is the only way. And we're not saying opening it completely. We're allowing for a porous border. Might I add that there are many other countries. Questions? No. 
There are many, <laughs> there are many other countries that allow for open borders. But additionally, they don't touch the argumentation where we talk specifically about six over 16,000 refugees, many immigrants from the Honduras crisis, from this Venezuelan crisis that are come, trying, trying to come up here and have a better life. But the dehumanization aspect completely outweighs any argument that they ever bring forth. Because at the moment that you're socially dead, you have no life. It doesn't matter if it's physical. Which means that we should care at utmost of what a person does or doesn't do. I'll leave you with this joke. Why did the pencil have a bad joke? Because it didn't have a point. Kind of like closing borders. Okay. <laughs> minority groups and the way that I reference my point that was kind of like pushed aside there because I do think that I guess like I relig or religious groups or indigenous groups wanting to preserve what they have or what makes them special basically from the colonizers that the last speak speaker talked about is important and that we should be allowed to keep out some borders to keep the white people out if necessary so that's going to be what I'm going to be talking about but first of all I'm going to do a little rebuttal because we were called out not engaging enough right okay the first speech gets up here and says we're keeping the best and brightest out aha I think that that's bad. I think that's why we have a visa system to bring in the best and brightest right now, and that's something that we should support. That is not, crucially, bringing in literally anyone who has no skills, if they don't have any skills, or like, bringing in all of the people all of the time. And they have to accept all of them. They keep muddling this point. They keep saying, we support open borders, but actually porous borders, but actually closed borders, right? Like, the literal motion is open borders all the time for everyone, and that's something that you have to defend, right? But crucially also, if you do accept taking in all of these people, then that, or just taking in the best and brightest, then that obviously it compounds the problem that Owen points out, which is the brain drain. Because if you're taking in the best and brightest to fill in American security jobs, then you're taking those jobs, uh, those people who are going to help out with the Col Colombian security, right? And those people probably have worse security threats than Americans do, right? So either or in this case, you're probably still losing it. The second thing I say is they keep Question. talking. No, thank you. They keep talking <laughs> about refugees. Look. As, as we pointed out, refugees have a right to refuge, right? Like, we, we would accept refugees in our house. That's not having open or closed borders. That's respecting international law, right? But what we're talking about is migration by choice. People like me, for example, who decided that I didn't really like Ireland that much, but there was nothing, there was no violence there. There was nothing stopping me from being there. I just thought it was a bit shit, and it is a bit shit, right? So I decided to move to the UK. This is what this debate is about, whether that kind of migration is good or bad, right? And we're saying that maybe it's good in some cases, maybe it's bad in other cases, but we shouldn't allow all of it all of the time. The last thing I'll say here is, they say, well look, like, visas don't let you work, right? And what we need to do is, we won't get that backlash that Owen talks about, because, you know, it'll be post-border kind of situation. Look, even if there are no borders, like, presumably we will still have nation states. So you still won't be a citizen of America, right? Because you were born in another country, unless they want to prop, like, that there would be no countries on Earth, right? Which is a slightly different debate. So we still think that discrimination will happen, right? They say that, oh, look, the hatred comes from the fact that there was a border. I mean, people still speak different languages. They still have different religions. They still have racial differences, and they still have different cultures, right? And the fact is that they can't erase the border from ever happening in our collective memory. We knew that like, these people from Central or Southern America were from a different country, and now we've, we've, we've been forced to let them all in, right? I think that's where the backlash comes from. And they're just saying that they prefer a world where the border never existed might have been true. But we're talking about opening it, and what would actually happen in the real world. And we think what in the real world is that those white nationalists will get very, very angry. Right? And that there will be like serious consequences as a result of that, right? And, and serious discrimination. I don't think we got like su like sufficient response to any of that, right? So look, I'm going to talk a little bit now about like identity, right? Okay. Because the thing is that like human beings aren't machines, right? Even though like capitalism would tell us to get up and eat and work and sleep, and that's literally the three things that you need to do to be a human being, I don't think that's true. I think that we get value in our lives from our connections with the people around us, from the languages that we speak, from our heritage, from our culture, from our, the art and music that we create, right? But I think that a lot of these things are actually culturally contingent, right? So like, I grew up speaking like, uh, I speak like a Gaelic language, or I do tap dancing in Ireland, yeah, I know. But like, you guys have like different festivals over here, and that's like pretty legitimate, right? But the thing is, that when we allow unrestrained, unlimited migration all the time, what happens is, is that the minority cultures die, right? Because, like, 
when people come into Ireland, right, and they speak English, and they only want movies that are written in English, oh thank you, right, or they come to Honduras, and they come to like uh, Samoan Islands, or wherever it is, right, the, the demand changes to produce for those people, because they're the ones that have all of the money, right, so we start marketing movies for them, we stop speaking our own languages, because the, the white man and the white tourist wants us to speak in English, right, so we stop speaking our languages and what connects us to our grandparents, at the point where an awful lot of people from indigenous backgrounds actually can't speak the languages that their grandparents speak anymore because they just learn English, right? So it happens both ways. First of all, people like Americans or like English people, they anglicize and they Americanize. They come into your country and they force you to make you share, right? So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, Native Americans and, and their tribes, right? This, this would literally be if all the white people came in and said, actually, I like this place. This is a cool place for me to hang out on my weekends. Mind if I just take this camp here, right? And we, we, we literally cannot keep them out, right? So it's gentrification on a massive scale. But the second way that it flows is that when you are an indigenous or minority person and you move to America or you move to England or any of those places and you are forced to assimilate because of the very racist things that Owen tells us about, right? That like people who have moved and migrants face enormous backlash and they face enormous pressure. What that means is you stop celebrating your own heritage, you stop celebrating your own culture, you stop speaking your language, and indeed you stop speaking in an accent, right? Like literally the amount of people who are probably looking at me blankly right now because I'm speaking in an accent, they can't understand a fucking word I'm saying, right? <laughs> so like what that means is you just become become the American, you just become the British person, whether you even want to do that or not, right? I think that is a loss. And I think these people feel incredibly atomized and incredibly alienated, and it means that they, they lose out in all these cultures that we thought that were special, and they thought that were special, and they gave them meaning in their lives, right? And that's what happens on their side of the debate, right? Because this mass pressure from America, from England, or from any of the massive cultures just erodes and erases, and I don't think that's very good. Did you have a point? Yes, I did. How do we decide who gets the right to live and who doesn't? Right to live. Okay, so that's amazing because it's almost like you ha still have a gap. You can sit down. You haven't grasped the refugee thing. So if you're going to be killed in your country, yeah, we should let you in. If you just live in Ireland and are fine, we should probably have a visa system to see whether you are going to add to the U.S. economy or you're going to detract from it. I think that that's legitimate, right? So like that's what we're talking about. That's the kind of migration by choice that this debate is centered around. Right. Okay. Look. So I think our response to this that we'll get is, right, well, diversity is really good, Maeve, and aren't you really proposing, like, separating all people all the time? That's clearly not what I'm doing. Shh. I think that cultural exchange is good, right, but it's on your terms, right? So if you say, actually, I, like, I would like if, uh, if, if um, like some people learned more about Ireland or learned more about Native American history, that is good. That's good cultural exchange. The difference is when there's a power okay. dynamic, no thank you, and when you're forced to share all the time, and you're forced to change it, and you're forced to make it bland, to make Mexican food like, palatable to white palates instead of being able to have it for yourself, right? That's, that is dangerous, and that is erosion. And it sounds really funny, but it isn't if you're coming from that background, and it isn't if you can't speak your own language. It isn't funny when white people get to take what is yours, but when you have it for yourself, then you are mocked, right? So when Indian people actually celebrate or wear their own clothes or eat their own curries, they're mocked as foreign, but when white people have it, it's really trendy and like they're putting it on their Instagram. That's not good enough, right? And what happens is we homogenize, we Americanize, and we take and we steal, and it's just new colonialization. I don't think that's good enough. I think sometimes minority communities need borders in themselves to protect themselves from these forces, and that's good enough reason to have them, and I urge you to propose. Here. Oh my goodness, we've got a border conflict going on right inside this room. Um, we've got an opportunity for you to be a part of the debate and ask questions of either our affirmative team or our negative team. And I actually have a, I have a tool to help me with this process to facilitate the question and answer period. This is just for you, friends, so you feel right at home. There we go. I've got my, my, my wand. That I'll be using to call on people. All right. yeah. we, are, we are debating the land of Harry Potter right now. So, do we have any questions for the uh, for the debaters? You can ask a question of the affirmative team or the. Uh, There's still two more speeches, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, question for Maeve. Maeve, yeah, well done. Yeah. It's a hard Irish name. So, uh, in following that closing argument, the question is. Uh, do you believe that people are culturally obligated to remain in their country, and at what point does necessity for moving away to a country 
overstate uh, their cultural obligations. In yeah. other words, is their oppression in their country a cultural obligation? Yes, I think that's really interesting as a person who did choose to leave, right? So like, I don't think that I'm culturally obliged to stay in Ireland, but that's on an individual. What I was talking about is on a mass level, when we, like you're obliged to take in all of the British people all the time and they erode your culture on mass, that's probably not good, right? Even if one British person like Owen and his friend of mine coming over and saying hi to visit me on a weekend, probably fine, right? It's it, when this happens on a mass scale, on a, on a scale that like erodes an entire culture, that's probably not good enough. Yeah. I just have a question for you. Yeah. Um, you talked about like um, kind of the words there. You talked about like not leaving Ireland because it's like you're fine there and like you just want to leave. Who's to judge what is fine conditions and what is not fine conditions? Because maybe in Mexico things aren't like awful, like in Syria, yeah. but there are people still facing oppression, but they can't leave. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good question, and I think at some point, yeah. If we're only referring to like refugees and taking in refugees, then there are some people who, who li whose lives are a bit shit that won't get in because of this policy. I think there's two tracks to deal with that. The first is that we will still have a visa system. So if you are qualified, if you have skills, or you're going to work in the United States, some people do get in anyway. But other than that, like also on the off, we have to swallow some harms, right? That yeah, some people will get left behind, but they also have to swallow harms. They have to swallow harms like the brain drain when those people do leave and those countries get worse as a result or like don't have skilled workers, right? So I mean like. People will be stuck, people will leave, and those countries will get worse. Both happen, and you have to decide which is more important. Okay. Yes, you. Um, this off is, me, okay, cool. <laughs> um, this is for you guys as well. Okay. Um, after the events of 2001, um, President George Bush happened to increase border security. Mm -hmm. um, actually, a little side note, I think most of the questions coming away are going to be from a humanitarian standpoint. Yeah, yeah. So that's the main opposition there. So, um, he increased border security, and by closing down the main pathways for immigration, uh, people were forced to go through the Arizona desert. Now, the uh, number of people who tried to immigrate legally went <coughs> down, however, the deaths stayed the same um, due to more people risking crossing the Arizona desert and perishing. Uh, how do you steel man the idea that uh, border security is a necessity to that extent? Uh to be clear, we've never tried to claim we want to increase border security. Like, uh, clearly the US's current border system is barbaric. <laughs> but like, the, the, uh, like, it's a 